So uh, one thing you can be sure about is when I start uploading videos on an almost daily basis, that I've got a whole lot of nothing to do. Business is slow and things are just not uh, happening right now. So uh, in order to entertain myself and hopefully you too, I'm presenting more of these videos. However, I'm not just talking to talk. Um, this is not fluff. This is real material that's very, very, very helpful. And today we're going to talk about minor third to major third, the little piece that means everything in the blues. And if you could get this, um, you don't have to worry about a lot of the other stuff I showed you. Uh, one thing you should know is a lot of this material flows from, um, it kind of integrates together. <clears throat> so for example, yesterday I was talking about chromatics. Well, in a way, th this uh, minor third to major third situation flows through the whole chromatic idea. It's, a, uh, after all, a half-step chromatic movement that we're doing. All right, so um, in order to demonstrate, I told you if we're in a G blues, we can play across the one, the four, and the five dominant seven chords, the, the, four, the three essential chords of a blues progression. We could play our G minor pentatonic all the way through. All right, but you can also play specifically a particular scale for each chord. And when we're dealing with pentatonics, that means for the G7, I can, aside from G minor pentatonic, the global scale, I can play G major pentatonic. Um, uh, aside from, uh, on the C7, aside from G minor pentatonic, I could play C major pentatonic. And on the D7, aside from G minor pentatonic, I could play D major pentatonic. However, when you play a pure pentatonic major like this, it won't sound bluesy. In fact, it will sound a little whitish and dorky, okay? Uh, before I go into what to do and how this works and everything else about it, um, I want to uh, go back to the 4, 7 to 1 resolution, which uh, to me, it holds a key uh, to how the blues works. We have uh, 4 in the key of G, or the rooted uh, G7 root of a blues. The four would be C7. And now you can even hear that. From C7 to G7. Well, all over the blues, you hear that. All right. That seems to come from that strange four dominant seven that is the only dominant uh, um, dominant chord that you can make from the notes of that key that doesn't resolve to chords within the key. I talked about this before. I won't go into it. If you've been sharp and watching, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but again, we have that resolution. And that is the one little piece that changes everything. All right. Now, in order to function properly with this stuff, first of all, when you do that move on a G7, as soon as you hit that major note, you've dedicated yourself to only the G7 chord. It will not work for C7. In fact, it will sound really bad for C7. Uh, what you have to do is move in parallel to the actual C7 chord and find the third of that. All right, let's start over. G7 chord. I have G, B, D, F are the notes of the G7 chord, okay? Root, third, fifth, seventh, root, third. So what we do in the blues convention is go flat third to third. And by the way, if you're descending or ascending, the convention is still to go up from minor third to major third. Now that is the third of the G chord, but when I get to C7, I have to deal with the third of the C7 chord which uh, the C7 is C, uh, C, E, G, B flat, and uh, so root third, fifth, seven, and um, here's my third. So against the C7, all right, and finally, once again, on the D7 chord, the five, seven chord of the blues, uh, the D7 chord is uh, D, F sharp, A, C, root third, fifth, seventh, You'll probably find that, well, if you looked at the arpeggios that I mentioned in yesterday's video, it's uh, downloadable. I left the link in, a, in the comment section, uh, speaking to somebody who was interested in that exercise. Uh, 
And hi there, and thanks for your comments and interest. It's much appreciated. I, I'm sorry I forgot your name. I'm not looking at uh, YouTube right now. Anyway, uh, so uh, for the D7, then we have root third, fifth, seventh. Now, if I only know knew the triads for G, C, and D, right? And I threw in root third, fifth. I, I added the flat third to third motion. All of a sudden, you can hear that blues element begin to enter, even more so when you include the seventh. All right. Now, uh, let's get to the scales I was talking about. Uh, um, oh, before I move on to that. So there's my point being the four dominant seven to one. <coughs> that movement is very unusual. You will not find one key that contains both G7 and C7, or one dominant seven and four dominant seven. There is no key that houses those two. Um, which leads me, like, the, I call all these blues clues. I'm led to believe that what we're looking at here goes way beyond the major minor key system and this key blending kind of thing. And especially in blues, there's really not a key, is a root center, but not a key you'd be concerned about. So I'm starting to believe that there is a big clue in that four dominant seven to one dominant seven, and that uh, um, it may be it's hiding some sort of system that hasn't emerged yet, but it's, it doesn't seem to be based on diatonic scales or anything like this. And that's why I call all this stuff blues clues, because they're pointing to something that it's driving me crazy, actually. I, I still haven't found the exact piece that, that puts it all together and says, this is why this all works. All right, anyway, so let's get back down to business. So now I, I uh, told you that for the G7 uh, chord, aside from the G minor pentatonic, you could play G major pentatonic, but if you play that in the blues, it doesn't sound very bluesy, does it? So you need to know uh, where the third is in the major pentatonic. Uh, so in the major pentatonic goes one, two, three. I'll do it on one string so you could visualize it. One, two, three, five, six, one. So if I was doing a straight major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Okay. What we're doing is eliminating the uh, four and the seven. So we get one, two, three, five, six, one. You can see the actual structure on one string. Whole step, whole step, step and a half. Whole step, step and a half. Now, if this was a G major scale, which it isn't, of course, it's a G major pentatonic scale, different than a diatonic, but we do get Do, Re, Mi. And this is the note you're concerned about. One, two, three, the third of the scale itself, which is equivalent to the third of the chord itself. Okay. So now, if I, if I throw the flat three in there as well root second flat third third now i'm getting something that sounds like the blues in fact this is a okay so um obviously there's something about that flat three to three another mysterious clue so now when you do your major pentatonic remember per chord so we're dealing with the g7 now instead of just going add that one little blue note and notice even when i'm descending the flat three to three goes up it never goes you can do it but um and, and it does show up in the turnaround but for the most part, when you're improvising, it sounds better uh, to go uh, up. So once again, G major pentatonic. G major pentatonic with the blue note or the flat three. All right, so that's what you could do on the G7 chord, aside from your G minor. And by the way, when you do the G minor, you should still be able to target the third of the G7 chord. Here's the flat three again. All right. 
So you need to have you know, your eyes really attuned to the elements of the chord and where they are. And I'm going to discuss something a little bit further um, today, hopefully, if I don't uh, blather too much in this first section of the video. So now, on the C7 chord, again, we could use our G minor pentatonic. And we could use C major, but again, a little plain vanilla. So what do we do? Again, of the C major chord, we have C, E, and G. And in the C major pentatonic, we start C, D, uh, C, D, E. So one, two, three, there's our third, right? So now when we do the C major pentatonic, and again, we get the blues sound. Okay. So then, again, you can get a lot of color because you, now you can combine your G minor pentatonic global around all three chords with the specific C major pentatonic with the blue note. All right, I resolve there back to G. Uh, and then finally against the D7 chord. There's my D major pentatonic. And of course, the global scale G minor pentatonic can work. All right. But also the D major, specific to the D7 chord, the D major pentatonic. And again, you know, the major pentatonic sounds, tends to sound a little country-ish. So you want to eliminate the sound to get a real blues sound. And once again, one, two, three, all right? So those are the first three notes of the pentatonic scale. One, two, three. So we know where our three is. It's a major third or two whole step distance from the root. Now I do my D major pentatonic with the blue note. Sounds like blues, okay? Now the question is, all right, we're in this little neighborhood here. What about around the guitar? How am I going to find all this stuff, right? You have to educate your eyeballs. First, you educate your mind with the words. You get the intellectual understanding of how this all works. Then you bring it to the guitar, and that, that's a bit of tedious, kind of frustrating, nose-to-the-grindstone work. It's so worth it. After you, you repeat it a number of times, it starts to get it embedded in your internal visual memory. And like, for example, when I'm soloing, I, I don't have to look at the guitar. I have a guitar neck in my head and I see my fingers move across it. So I have the visual. Point being, though, with the visual comes an, uh, a visual recognition of where root third and fifth is. Not, not a bunch of words in my head going... Okay, this is the root, so uh, that's two whole steps, but then i got to translate that to the G string. By that time, the song's over, right? So you have to visually see root, third, fifth, and a chord. Now, I'm bringing up a new uh, approach here, which I haven't discussed before, and that is triads. Long time ago, one of my favorite guitar players, Larry Carlton, mentioned uh, about improv. He said, it's all about the triads. And at the time, I was more of a scale guy. I would, uh, I would link uh, chords together and figure out what scale they suggested. And I didn't understand what he meant. But over time, as I studied arpeggios, I, I understood more and more of what he meant. It really is all about the triads. So that's what we're going to look at today. I will include a link uh, to a chart of all, tri all the triads. What I'm going to do is a triad consists of three notes. So... When I play this G major triad, how come there's six notes? One, two, three, four, five, six. If you have any experience with the guitar, you know the answer to this. Well, there are redundant notes. You have G, B, D, G, B, G. So we have a few Bs and a few Gs, right? Three Gs, two Bs, and the D. What we're going to do is we're going to narrow the triad down to only its three notes. And the way to do that is do it for uh, every set of three strings. So this is the one, two, three set. One, two, three. The first three strings, string one, string two, string three. Now what we have here is this triad. All right. 
Now I'm going to upload the graph, so I don't want to talk too much about while well, you put your first finger on the uh, third fret and bar to the B string, and then put your middle finger on the fourth fret of the G. Too tedious. You'll see it in the graph, so just download the graphs and you'll get it. So what I'm going to show you right now is on these three strings, I'm going to play three different G chords. G, using the D shape, the one you play down here, but this time at the uh, seventh and eighth fret, G, and finally this shape, G. And uh, yeah, that's slightly out of tune, but to hell with it. There's a problem. Okay, so now I have G, G, and G. The next set, and don't worry that I'm going fast. Again, you can download the graphs and look at them. The next set is two, three, four. The second, third, and fourth strings, B, G, and D strings. So G, G, and G. The next set is three, four, five. G string, D string, and A string. G, G, G. And finally, the last set, uh, in this case, I have to use the open string, but if there was, uh, I'll, I'll ignore that one and I'll go up the octave. Uh, the next set is G, G, G. All right. Now, here's, here's the thing. Let's look at the first set, G, G, and G. The first thing you, you have to grasp of the components of the chord is where is the root? And this, this is called the first inversion of G. The root is in the, the uh, E string. You probably already know that. When I use this D sh shape at the seventh and eighth frets, the root is in the B string, G right there. And finally, when I do this shape, which comes off this double bar chord, root is in the G string. We know where the roots are. In this shape, the root is in the E string. This shape, the root is in the B string. This shape, the root is in the G string. Now, the exercise to learn this first is to do one, four, and five. In the key of G, one, four, and five is G major, four is C major, and five is D major. Now, it's like a little video game you're gonna be playing here. You have, to, you have to exhaust all three in the neighborhood you're in. So example, here's a G chord. I want the most nearby C. Well, the root of this one is here. I got it from here, but this is a G note, so I take this all the way down, I have a C chord. And finally here, I have the D chord, one, four, five. Now that I know where the root is, this is a study you should do with all of these shapes if you really wanna get them down. Now I can start my G chord here, and I want a G, C, and D in the neighborhood. I get this. And then finally up here, the one that's always out of tune for some reason, I get a G, a C, and a D. Remember, I'm exhausting all three of these shapes, all right? That's important. Once you get the roots, the next thing you do is look for the thirds. In this chord, the third is in the G string. In this chord, the third is in the E string. And in this chord, the third is in the B string. So when you're in this section of the neck and you want to get the blue sound, you have your triad, and it's a G, right? Now, one other note that would be beneficial for you to, don't stick it in the triad, but to be aware of where it might be in relation to the triad you're doing, is the flat at seventh. There are two ways to find the flat at seventh off of these triads. One way is to take the root and go down a whole step. The other way is to take the fifth and go up a step and a half. Now, uh, all right, you get that. Now, I flatted the third. Again, the, what this whole lecture is about, flat three to three. Then you have this G chord. And again, you can find the seventh by taking the root, go down a whole step. We're taking the fifth and going up a step and a half, which is a minor third. Then this shape, 
always out of tune. Anyway, I, I'm just tired of dealing with this, so, you know. Anyway, so we have the root here. The seventh is over here, a whole step below the root. Or here's the fifth, a step and a half above the fifth. Now, when you, you can see the advantage of a study like this. If I'm doing a blues, and of course, blues is one, four, five. So if I do this, G7, C7, D7, G7. All right, if I'm up here, G7, C7, D7. All right. This is how I know exactly where I am on the neck at any given time by having studied the major triads and practicing them in uh, 145 in the neighborhood. Now, when you get really incredibly geeky at this, of course, you should also find the fifth and know where the fifth is in all of these. Then here comes the fun part. Translate all of these into minor chords by lowering the third a half step. G major becomes G minor, C major becomes C minor, and D major becomes uh, D minor. So now you do minor one, four, five. This G major here, here's my third, flat it. Here's my C major, flat the third. Here's my D major, flat the third. So I get. and so on and so forth. I know this is really involved, but really, really, if you start to study this, you could probably nail it in a couple of weeks, actually, if you're really, really sharp. And remember, this isn't all words in your head. At first it is, it's all my explanations and all like this stuff. And it's important to remember those explanations, like where is the root and flat three to three, and how do I find the flat seven, all that stuff are words in your head right now. But see, for me, it's all in the eyes. When you think about it, the uh, sound waves are much, much slower than light waves, which are instantaneous, right? If you're dealing with your ears, meaning hearing words in your head, even if they're virtual ears inside of your brain, hearing yourself talk to yourself in theory terms, that's going to be really slow, right? Uh, I could demonstrate, but you already know. Uh, well, let me see. Here's the root. So uh, the third is over here. And if I flat the third and then go up, well, the song's over by then, like I said earlier. How do I have this instantaneously speed of light? You make it a visual phenomenon. When you see this, you immediately see there's root, there's fifth, there's third. When you see this, fifth, third, root. When you see this, root, third, fifth, all right? And the ability to visualize where the seventh is, sometimes in two spots around this triad, like in this case, or, all right? All right, so I uploaded the graphs. The graphs will give you, inside the chord graph, you'll get the fingerings, what fingers to use. I believe uh, to the left, I, I forget now, but you'll see uh, uh, the fret numbers. So in other words, I'm gonna give you all Gs. You get this, 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 and uh, uh, this, th this, and this, okay? I think that comes to 12 different G chords, all right? Um, you'll get that in the graph. And then, what, again, just follow the steps I showed you. Find the root first of all of them. Find out where the root is. And by the way, below the graph, you'll see R35 or 53R telling you which string to find the root on. This will help guide you through this process. This is a great enriching exercise that, if I must say so myself, I invented and put together. Uh, trust me, this one little thing will make a world of difference in your blues playing. If you could find the third of the specific chord you're on, flat it, and then raise it. Now, I'm going to demonstrate to you when you know what you're doing, when you work through arpeggios, how you can hear the chords change without there being an instrumentalist behind me playing the chords. Okay, so I'm going to do that.
you can hear the 12 bar blues in there. And I could even make it more complicated, put the jazz turnaround in it. across all the chords. In the case of the jazz turnaround, I had an E7 and A minor uh, uh, thrown in there for the turnaround changes, which uh, I played in uh, yesterday's video. All right, this is, study this, because you will sound more and more and more like a true, authentic, knowledgeable, sophisticated blues musician. And the reason why, in a sense, blues can be even more sophisticated than jazz, in a way, is because it's not based on the logic of linear scales. As you can see here, there are certain conventions you employ, but there's no theory behind the conventions. You just do them and you know they sound like blues. That's way more confusing. You have to be instinctive more than intellectual when you do this stuff. It's a feeling you get when you flat that third. Um, and again, you know, philosophically speaking, it's bitter and sweet. Minor is sad, the minor third. Major is gives you a resolution. Ah, things are much better now. And when the blues, when we pit minor against a major chord, we have both happy and sad at the same time. It's as if it's day and night at the same time. But, uh, uh, pardon me, emotionally speaking, uh, it's bitter, the sad part, and sweet, the happy part. The blues is bittersweet. It's it's a joyous celebration in a way, and it's an alchemy. It's an alchemy a way of alchemizing your dark negative feelings and expressing them so they become something joyful and beautiful for other people to listen to as well as yourself. So that is the beauty of the blues, man. I am so pissed off that we're losing it. Like it's water down the drain at this point. This is such an important phenomenon in music. And it seems like music is de-evolving rather than evolving right now. I am here to hold up, hold up before people like myself, Rick Beato, and other music educators that know what we're talking about. We're doing our best to preserve the best that there is in music itself, okay? And with that uh, little inspirational note, I bid you farewell, and I'll see you soon.